Akwe, my name is Melissa Tantaquijan Zobel. I have served the Mohegan tribe in many capacities. I'm currently the tribal historian, and in the past I have been the medicine woman of the tribe, a tribal counselor. I was vice chair, sat on the council of elders, and uh, I was also in charge of the cultural department for many years, and I'm happy to be with you here today. Well, it's very interesting when people talk about the Tanaquijan family because really the whole Mohegan tribe is the Tanaquijan family. And a lot of people don't realize that. Uh, if you go back to uh, the days of Samson Occam and Lucy Occam Tanaquijan, uh, almost all the tribe is descended from them. And so the thing that separates a tribe from a family on the outside is that everyone's related and everyone's related multiple times. And so when I think of the Tanaquijan family, uh, I can't really separate it from the Mohegan tribe. Uh, to me, tribe is about tribe. Family is not quite the same to me. Um, tribe is, is bigger and older and deeper, and also uh, carries more traditions than just the Tanaquijans. The Tanaquijan name is kind of interesting because it came from our famous Tanaquijan runner. His name actually means going along faster in the water. That's what Tanaquijan means. And he was a runner for Chief Uncas back in the 1600s. Uh, the name, however, uh, almost died out. And so uh, in the 1990s, it was really just uh, Gladys and Ruth Tantaquidgen. Some folks had shortened their name to Quidgen. And so I took my matriarchal family name of Tantaquidgen and changed my name so that the name wouldn't die out. And since then, a lot of other folks who have Quidgen or are in different families have taken back the Tanaquijan name, but it literally was the last indigenous name in the state of Connecticut, so I didn't want anything to happen to it. Well, I, I think the hardest thing about being a Native American and a historian is that most of what you read about your own people is wrong. And so when you hear it from your elders and it doesn't jibe with what you're hearing in school or what you're reading, uh, it's very confusing to children. And so I became interested in history mainly to fix that confusion in my own head. You know, uh, James Fenimore Cooper wrote The Last of the Mohegans, and he used Sachem Uncas in that story, and Uncas is a Mohegan. Now, the names are spelled differently, but they said that Uncas was the last of our people, and almost all of us are descended from Sachem Uncas. So, uh, I kind of wanted to know, how did these misunderstandings and misnomers come to be? And a lot of times they had to do with something that we now call colonization. Uh, a good example of a misnomer would be Moship's Rock. Moship's Rock is an important sacred site to Mohegans. It's where the giant Moship stepped and his footprint is still there to this day. It's always filled with water. But for years when I was growing up, it was called the Devil's Footprint. And the reason it was called the Devil's Footprint is that a lot of colonists didn't understand Mohegan traditions. And many times missionaries denigrated them because it was a spirituality that they didn't understand. And so when I started to find out about these, these sites that were called, you know, devil's this or something bad, and realized that there was nothing wrong with them at all, I think that made me want to study more history and learn more about my people and, and realize, you know, how much some of these very beautiful customs had actually been denigrated and needed to be uh, really brought out into the open so people could fully understand them. So oral tradition is fascinating because many people think that, well, if it's written down, it's true and it's right and it's wonderful. But what they don't realize is that for so many centuries in Europe, most people were illiterate. And so the only people that were writing down stories might be monks or people who were affluent or people who had a very specific agenda in what they wrote. It certainly wasn't women until very recently. And so when you, when you read a lot of things that are written down, you only hear from a certain group of people. The difference with an oral story is that if I recite something in front of my people, people will correct me if I make a mistake. People can add their own additions to it. But more than that, I was taught that if you can forget it, you never really knew it. Which means that you don't just learn a story by rote and memorize it. You must understand the meaning of it. Now what's so great about understanding the meaning of it is that even though you're telling it perhaps in a different language, you can easily translate it because you understand the point of the story and the deeper meaning of the story. And, and that turns out to be important to people like us who aren't speaking our, our indigenous language. We're not speaking the native language of Connecticut, which is Mohegan. We're speaking English. And so 
first the stories were translated to English, and then you know, we might tell them to someone who speaks another language. So you really need to understand stories at a visceral level. You know, what is the deeper meaning of this story? What is the point of it? Uh, it's at one level maybe for children and another level for adults. It's at a different level maybe for the elders. And so, uh, so that's why oral tradition has its own, uh, its own prose that a lot of people don't realize. Well, in my case, I'm sort of odd, but in my case, I would have to say Gladys Tantequidgen was my inspiration. Uh, I spent the most time with her. And the reason she's my inspiration, even though I've loved and adored many women in the tribe, is that she set a standard that was impossible to meet. And I think that's kind of the definition of inspiration, is someone who you see that is just so good at what they do, or so knowledgeable that you say, well, maybe I can be half that good one day, you know? And that's, that's always been a, a wonderful bar that she set for so many of us. The inspiration for the Tanakoji Museum uh, came from John Harold and Gladys Tantakoji. John was my great-grandfather, and Gladys and Harold were uh, my great-aunt and great-uncle. My grandmother was their sister. A museum is a place where people go to learn about something, right? And if you want to learn about Native people, you certainly can't do it in the history books locally because they weren't going to tell you anything about us. So they believe that it's hard to hate someone you know a lot about, and that that museum would teach people about our people, and that the people who gave the tours should be Mohegans themselves. And that way, you wouldn't just hear one story, but you would hear different stories, again, from different families not just the Tanaquidgens. And so now, you know, we have many different families giving tours at the museum. You get to hear many stories of the Mohegan tribe. And uh, the idea is that you'll feel welcome there. Um, when I was a child, we were taught to greet everyone in their native language. So if someone came from Japan, you know, Konnichiwa, you know, Korea, Haseo, you'd say, you'd say hello to people, you know, bonjour, whatever. And you would, you would make sure that the person felt welcome. And the reason we did that is, we suffered so greatly as a people from the loss of our language that was um, enforced by colonization and not being able to speak in schools, that we know how important it is for people from other countries to be able to hear their own language spoken and to feel welcome. And uh, that's, that's, that's the sort of the, the mission of the museum. In terms of the artifacts, uh, it's funny, they used to say that you weren't supposed to touch things, touch things in museums without gloves, and now, there's a big new study that says you can, you can touch them with your hands. So I like that because we always used to let people touch them with their hands because we believe every object is a living thing that has a spirit. And even if you don't get to touch something there, you're around those spirits. And the best story uh, about the living nature of those things is that a couple years after the museum was built, there was a huge fire at the Tanaguchin house, right near, actually between the house and the museum in the woods. And there was only enough water to save one or the other, the house or the museum. And so the Tanaquisians had to decide what they would do, and they saved the museum. And their family home burned down. And if they hadn't, several years earlier than that, moved all the artifacts and things that were in their attic into the museum, all those ancient ancestors and relations, like Uncas Collar and Fidelia Field Expelled, they would all have been lost. So uh, that museum to me is not a lot like other museums. It's, it's different, it's special, and uh, it's really a good reflection of who we are as a people. The Mohegan Church Ladies Sewing Society reminds me a lot of the traditional grandmother societies that preceded it before colonization. Uh, it used to be in a lot of Iroquois and Algonquin societies that you couldn't go to war, for instance, unless the women allowed it. Now think how great that is, because who suffers the most in war if there's pillaging or raping or terrible things happen, right? The women have to be ready for it and acknowledge that. So what happened was the women in our sewing society then came to be the ones who chose our leaders. They would pick our chiefs. And they would look at young people and they would assess their character and their abilities. But what was most important is that people who are the family members of a prospective leader are supposed to also bring forth their shortcomings. Because you, you don't want someone to leave your group, even if it's your own child. If there's a shortcoming they have, it perhaps could endanger the group. So uh, this group did that. They also made quilts, they also sewed, they also did you know all the women's crafts that were allowed in that sort of an environment of a church lady sewing society. But 
Tribal politics has always been something that tribal women were involved in because, of course, their right to vote was not suppressed within the tribe. So the tribe's federal recognition was based on about seven points, and social and political continuity are the most important of those points and the hardest to prove in many ways because you have to show that since 1600, you've continued as a social and political entity. So a political entity means you know, you still had chiefs, you still had councils, which of course we have the whole time and we can show. But to show you still had gatherings is a little trickier because, for instance, um, during the um, Second World War and to the Korean War, there weren't very many celebrations had because men were away, which meant that it was not considered appropriate, remember, war to have a big party, but also that a lot of the things that they, the men would build, like the giant structures and things, you didn't have enough young people or fit people to build them. So you saw these things that might seemingly be gaps, and one of the things that was fascinating about it was that uh, there was not an understanding at that time by the United States government that women could be political leaders. Um, a lot of history was written very focused on men, and so they said, well, nobody was doing anything then because the men were away. And we said, well, the women were still having the sewing, the women were still meeting and having political meetings in the women's sewing society. So the political activity of these women um, was a means of proving continuity. But in Mohegan, that wasn't the first time that happened. Uh, in the 1800s, the men were also away almost all the time whaling. Because whaling was the way men made a living in most Mohican men in the 1800s. Why? Because whatever color you were, you were paid the same thing as a whaler. And that's a very important thing to know because it meant that that was the best way to bring home money for your family was to go away and whale. The problem with that is though that it means that, uh, you know, there's going to be a huge difference between uh, people in a family who've been all over the world and those who've never left Mohican. And I can't imagine the culture clashes of, you know, these men who've seen everything and been everywhere coming home here. And, you know, many of the people maybe have, have never crossed the Connecticut River. Uh, so um, still though, you know, it, it means that the women have been in charge very often and for a long time. Focus, if you are, if you are a young girl and you want to um, learn about your people and you want to understand them and you want to, become a contributor in your tribe, which is how you should look at it, because that's, that's the best way to rise up. What you need to do is think about one word, and that is decolonization. You need to say to yourself, what things have happened in this tribe that are Mohegan, and what things have happened to this tribe that have taken away our Mohegan-ness? And try to bring back as many of those things that are Mohegan as you possibly can, because those are the things that make us whole. One of the ways that you restore self-esteem to young people is to make sure they don't use words like primitive about their own language or their own people, or that they don't think there's a devil's footprint because it's a sacred site. You need to make sure that your young people learn about who they are, that they respect it, and that they're proud of it. And the only way to do that is to really dig deep into your ancient customs and be aware that the Mohegan language is a beautiful language. It teaches us about the natural environment. Um, most, most things are named after what they do. Rivers are named after the kinds of fish that are in them, and, and places aren't named after people. They're named after environmental phenomena. So uh, in today's world, uh, our culture and our traditions have an important place, uh, especially in a world that's in danger of environmental collapse. Um, what do you think is something that mainstream society about the simplest thing would be that um, women and men are in this together and um, if you think of the earth as your mother and you think of um, everything on the planet as a living being um, gender is not really something that is a focal point anymore it's, it's about everything being healthy and everyone being healthy and the water being healthy and the plants being healthy, you know, and, and the land being healthy. And, um, and you, can't, you can't divide things into, um, into gender. Our language doesn't have a gender, which is really interesting. Um, and so I think that 
it gives a more balanced view of, of people as people. And, and that's the biggest message is, you know, people are people.